Atlanto-occipital dislocation, also known as internal decapitation, and its management occipitocervical fusion. The atlanto-occipital joint is an important transitional region which supports and stabilizes the cranium to the spine with its surrounding ligamentous structures. Atlanto-occipital dislocation was previously known to be rare, but more recently, this injury has been identified more frequently. This is especially in children, and this is because of possibly uh, the faster response by the ER teams and the faster diagnosis. It's more, twice, more than twice as common in pediatrics as in adults, and this is possibly due to the relatively large head in pediatrics, the lax ligaments, and the less cupped condyles. Anatomy. The stability of the atlanto-occipital joint is primarily due to ligaments and less uh, involved are the bones and capsules. The most important ligaments involved are the tectorial membrane with both its superficial and deep parts and the alar ligaments. The ligaments involved, we have some famous diagrams and well known in the anatomy textbooks. Ligaments that connect the atlas to the occiput appear, you will see it clearly in the, in the sagittal, sagittal diagrams, which are the anterior atlanto occipital membrane, posterior atlanto occipital membrane and the ascending band of the cruciate ligament. Here are the ligaments, anterior atlas occiput, atle, uh, um, anterior atlanto-occipital membrane, posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, and the ascending ligament, uh, ascending band of the cruciate ligament. The ligaments that, uh, the other ligaments appear, uh, appear more clearly in the coronal section. So uh, the ligaments that connect the axis the second cervical vertebra to the occiput are the tectorial membrane with its superficial and deep parts, the alar ligaments. Um, uh, the alar ligament has two parts, and the uh, occipital alar portion, which is this one we are discussing here, and the atlanto alar portion which connects C1 to C2. The apical odontoid ligament here we can see in the coronal section the posterior view of the ligaments that connect uh, that are found at the cranial cervical junction. Here is the tectorial membrane, here is the atlanto, uh, here is the apical ligament and here is the alar ligament. The ligaments that connect the axis to the atlas, of course, the transverse ligament is the, fir is the first one with the, which is the strongest ligament of the spine. The atlanto alar por portion of the alar ligament and the, the descending band of the cruciate ligament. Ascending and descending bands of the and descending bands of the cruciate ligament uh, transfer the power and the, the strength indirectly to the above and below vertebrae. The bones. Here we can see posterior view of the craniocervical junction. We can see the occipital condyle. The, the 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 facet of C1 and here is the um, the articular uh, portion of a cervical junction. 
or cervical thoracic junction, uh, cervical uh, uh, condylar uh, cervical junction. Here is the superior view, and we can see superior articular facet, superior view of C1 actually, superior articular facet, foramen transversorium, the posterior arch of C1 with its posterior tubercle. The transverse process of C1 here is also the anterior arch and the anterior tubercle. Here is the inferior view of the skull base. And here uh, are the occipital condyles at the anterior part of the foramen magnum. The classification of the atlanto occipital dislocation, uh, the most uh, important is tray nilis classification. This one is called the tray nilis classification. And the tray nilis classification is classified the dislocation of the Atlanto occipital junction into four uh, into three types. Type one is anterior dislocation, type two is vertical longitudinal dislocation, and type three is posterior dislocation. We can see this figure that illustrates the types. Type one, just uh, um, to remember this, type one here is anterior dislocation, and type two is the skull moves to the top. Type one, the skull moves anteriorly, Type 2, the skull moves to the top. And type 3, the skull moves posteriorly. It is a hidden and divergent problem in both clinical and radiological aspects. So many issues are discussed in both aspects in order to clarify the topic. Just for your knowledge, you will not find a clear clinical picture like symptoms and signs like other problems and also in the radiological management, you will not find like uh, CT, MRI, X-ray. It is not that simple because the disease is hidden even in the diagnosis and the problem even in the, uh, hidden in diagnosis and management. It needs active participation in even diagnosis and management. Clinical presentation. The clinical presentation, uh, there are some facts to know that the wide and capacious canal at the site makes the spinal cord injury less common than expected. However, when present, it can cause sudden death and major problems. Up to 20% of patients may have normal neurological examination at presentation. And even only neck pain can be the presenting symptom. However, the majority of patients pre present with unconsciousness and even respiratory arrest. Also, lower cranial nerves may be affected. In more severe cases of atlanto-occipital dislocation, it can present with spinal cord injury, either complete or incomplete, unilateral or bilateral. And if it is complete, we have to remember to differentiate it from spinal shock through the clinical examination. Even autonomic dysregulation can occur, including neurogenic shock, may also be the presenting symptom. The resulting hemodynamic instability can lead to the team or the trauma team to negative exploratory laparotomies that may deteriorate the case. <clears throat> and finally, it may, pre it may present with vertebral dissections, carotid dissections, or ischemic strokes. strokes. Thus, until the images are done and the clear diagnosis to be finalized, the high-energy trauma patients 
should be dealt with as Atlanto occipital dislocation. The radiologic evaluation, given the complex, as we, as we mentioned before, anatomical and biomechanical factors, single measurement is not the, the solution for such problem. So we have to do coronal and sagittal planes in all uh, in, uh, in all images, and also care should be taken that the clinical and radiological figure is different in adults and pediatrics. The trainless classification just finished. It is type 1, 2, and 3, and type 1, anterior dislocation of the skull, type 2, top dislocation of the skull, and type 3, posterior dislocation of the skull. The powers ratio. Here we will discuss the, uh, the most important figures suggested for the diagnosis, uh, the radiological diagnosis of plantoccipital dislocation. The powers ratio is one of the old measures taken, and the key of it, it is that is to know that it is from the skull base to C1. So it is old. It started at the beginning. It's from the skull base to E1 uh, to C1. The distance from the basion to the midpoint of the anterior cortex basion to the midpoint midpoint of the anterior cortex of posterior arch of C1 and also the distance from the opithion to the midpoint of the posterior cortex of anterior arch of C1. So it is very important to know that the, uh, the lines are to the inside of C1. So from the skull base to the inside of C1 here, skull base to the inside, this is outside, this is inside, this is outside, this is inside. And it's important to know it's normally uh, um, the, uh, the basion to, uh, to uh, the basion to C, B to C, the basion to the, uh, the anterior arch, uh, the, sorry, the anterior aspect of posterior arch of C1 is less than the opadion to the posterior aspect of anterior arch of C1. So this line should be divided by, by this line to be less than one. It is normally, it is normally uh, O, 0.9 less than 0.9. If it exceeds one, this indicates anterior dislocation injuries. So this power ratio was primarily suggested for the diagnosis of trainalis type one anterior dislocation injuries, and it was weak point that it cannot give some some benefits to diagnosis of type 2 and type 3. Here's the X-line method. It's the next method after powers ratio, and it's the same way. It is also X-line. So it measures the measures from the skull base to the inside of C2, and it'll, it involves a line, as you can see, from the base unit inside of C2 posteriorly, the lowermost part, and the opasion to the inside, innermost part of the posterior aspect of C2 body also. We can see, and it is useful in detecting type 2 and type 3. The Harris method, based on the Bayesian dense and Bayesian axis measures. These 
measures were were described before Hare's method, and he combined and they combined uh, uh, combined both methods uh, as a measurement. The Bayesian dense, as you can see from the Bayesian to the dense, the top of the dense is a vertical is a vertical distance and vertical measurements. So it is also useful in the vertical type of trainalis type two and the Bayesian axis. The Bayesian axis interval is horizontal interval. And so it is useful in both type one and type three, the vertical types of trainees classification. The CC interval or condylar gap method is another method and it is first was described for the pediatric population but now it, in, it is used also for the adult population. It is also described for type 2 trainees classification and best to be illustrated in the coronal image. Here is the CC interval, condyle C1 interval, condyle C1 interval. Whenever it is more than two millimeters in adults or, uh, or five millimeters in children, this indicates abnormality. Also, asymmetry of both joints is an indication of abnormality. The treatment, the initial management should be directed to stabilization by halo orthosis or sandbags. Cervical traction is contraindicated specifically in type 2 because it worsens the clinical condition. It can cause deterioration in 10% of the cases. Subsequent management either Prolonged immobilization for 4 to 12 months with hello base, which is horrible actually, and the surgical solution of posterior occipital cervical fusion, which is usually recommended. The outcome depends on, the, on clinical presentation and neurological deficit at presentation. Occipital cervical fusion is indicated in the following condition, actually, our condition, the occipital cervical instability, and C1, C2 instability whenever the failure of fusion of C1, 2 is expected or previously failed. Also, we can classify the topic into congenital, traumatic, inflammatory, neoplastic, and miscellaneous indications. The range of motion is affected, unfortunately, to, four, to 30 degrees of flexion and extension loss and the lateral rotation the lateral rotation is lost by, by 10% why while the lateral bending is lost by 8% the techniques many techniques has been proposed for this issue However, they started with wiring, and the wiring was, was considered as an old-fashioned because it doesn't result in complete fixation and rigidity. It is only semi-rigid fixation. This is wiring before using wires and plates, and actually, I think nobody is trying this method, this method right now. The keel plate occipital, occipital cervical fusion, it is preceded by CT for both the occiput to see the thickness of the occipital bone and also for the cervical part to check C2 and even C3 and others according to the level which will be subjected to fixation. The occipital keel screws and plates. The drill is used with tap and screwdriver 
Midline holes are prefer preferred because the thickness of the skull in this area is thicker than the periphery. We start using the to set uh, use the drill guide uh, with eight millimeters, then increase by two millimeter each time, and use a guide and tap until we reach the inner cortex, or the maximal will be 14 to 16 millimeters. And the screws of the occiput has some characters. It is not sharp uh, from uh, the interior tip, from the tip, as we see, and with similar shape to this. Here is also the occipital uh, uh, drilling and occipital screw application. We can see here the center. The center carries more thickness than, than the periphery. Here we can see some different plates and models of plates. This is one type, another similar type or different type, and this is a third type. And this is the occipital, uh, the cervical fusion. The C2 pedicle screws, we can also memorize the number 2030. And the 2030 is for the coming data and numbers. The entry point is an important. In each screw, we have to know the entry point. The entry point is to be detected at the center of the surface projection of C2 pars. How to identify? We can identify the pars and using the Penfield number for intraoperative, we palpate the medial and superior aspect of the parts, then we detect the center and we detect our entry point. The directions are 20 to 30 directions medially, degrees I mean, and midway between 20 and 30, it's just 25 vertical and I mean uh, superior, superior directions. So, uh, also, the diameter uh, of the screws is 3.5 uh, millimeters, and the, the length is, of course, from 20 and less, and it can increase from 20 to 30, 30 in some cases, like, like hangman's fracture. The C3 lateral mass screws, if used, and these rules of screw application is, uh, applies from three, C3 to C6. The entry point is one millimeter to the midpoint of the lateral mass, and the trajectory is 13 degrees laterally and 15 kephalat, and also 3.5 millimeter diameter is the screw and 14 to 16 millimeter length. And the rod also is 3.5 millimeter in diameter. And this is a, a funny information. Um, just to know that we can memorize it also when we remember the intramuscular injections, it is directed to the upper lateral quadrant. And also we start, but there are some difference in the entry point actually, but our screws are directed to the upper lateral quadrant of the lateral mass. Screw uh, entry point, here we can see it, it is one millimeter medial to the center of the lateral mass, and the direction here is 30 degrees and 15 kephalet. Another method for occipital cervical fusion is occipital condyle to C1 polyaxial screw fixation. The occipital condyle screws are inserted four 
uh, starting the entry point 4 to 5 millimeter lateral to the foramen magnum and 1 to 2 millimeter rostral to the atlanto occipital joint and um, um, we can sacrifice any missionary vein in that area. The trajectory is about 17 degrees medially and five, five degrees superior, so it is nearly horizontal uh, in vertical direction. And the diameter also 3.5 millimeters and about 22 millimeter length. Here we can see posterior view to see here is a relation to the vertebral artery. Here is the condylar screw. And here also the condylar screw in lateral view. And the lateral uh, mass screw of C1, the entry point is midpoint of the inferior part of C1 lateral mass midpoint of the inferior part of C1 lateral mass and the trajectory is direct is 17 degrees medially and 22 degrees vertically. The target is the superior aspect of the anterior tubercle of C1. Also the diameter is 3.5 millimeter. Uh, there is another method called the occipital C1 atlanto occipital transarticular screws. It is promising, but only few cases reported. I, and I'd like to thank you very much, and I uh, I hope that I uh, solved any problem related to this topic. Thank you very much.